As we are empowered by grace in Christ Jesus, we can endure hardships, be diligent in our labors, and become vessels of honor for the Lord's use. Each of us can become a vessel of honor that is cleansed, set apart, available, and fully equipped for every good work God wants to release through us. There used to be a time when you went to the doctor if you were not keeping well, and uh, the first thing they do is they tell you, show me your tongue. <laughs> they make you stick out your tongue, and they kind of look at that, look at your tongue, and somehow mysteriously make some diagnosis by just looking at your tongue. So turn with me, please, in your Bible to Proverbs chapter 18. Proverbs 18, we'll read verses 20 and 21. Proverbs 18, verses 20 and 21. It says, a man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. From the produce of his lips, he shall be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruits. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And what our inner person, our inner person is affected by the fruit of our lips, by the words that come out. The words that we speak actually affects our own selves, affect our own lives. And deaths in life are in the power of the tongue. So, you know, if something's going wrong, stick out your tongue. <laughs> Look at it in the mirror. <laughs> See what's happening. Show me your tongue. You know. What kind of words are we speaking? Are we speaking words of life? Or are we speaking words that bring death, destruction, ruin our lives? Or are we speaking words that bring hope, that, dis that say what God has said uh, about us? And I want to encourage you and me to understand that words have powerful impact on ourselves and also on the people that we speak to. Words have a powerful impact. And so we must learn to speak words of life, words of blessing, words of edification, words that strengthen our own lives and, of course, the lives of people that we speak to. Amen? Let's stand to our feet right now. As we make our declaration this morning, we are going to declare, we're going to speak words of life, we're going to speak words that will bless us, and bless us as a community as well. So if you brought your Bibles, lift it high up in the air. Let's say this out loud, bold and strong. This is God's word. This is God's, word. This is God speaking to me. Speaking to me. I, am I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I'm blessed. Victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of His blessing to many people. I receive His word. I believe His word. And I live by His word. Christ is my master. And to Him, I am in absolute surrender. In Jesus' name. Amen. Please turn around to people around you, in front of you, behind you, beside you, shake hands, say hello, give them a smile, and then you may be seated, please. We've been studying through 2 Timothy. Uh, we covered chapter 1, so this morning we're going to go through 2 Timothy chapter 2. So let's read 2 Timothy, we'll read the entire ch uh, chapter 2, we'll just read the entire chapter and then we'll spend some time uh, looking at what we can draw from this chapter. 2 Timothy chapter 2, you therefore my son be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things you have heard from me among many witnesses 
Commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hard-working farmer must be first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer even to the point of chains, but the word of God is not chained. Therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. This is a faithful saying, for if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. Hymenus and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are His. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility correcting those who are in opposition if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. As we said last week, Paul's second epistle to Timothy is a little bit more personal. Uh, his first epistle was a lot of instruction. How do you take care of the local church and so on? But in this episode, in second, the second episode, this is a very personal letter. Paul is disclosing a lot about his own life, his own ministry as a servant of God. And he is instructing another young man how to be a servant of God. How do you live as a man of God? So he's instructing. So it's a lot of personal things, personal lessons that you and I can take away if, uh, on how to serve the Lord, how to be ministers or servants of the Lord in our day, in our time. This, of course, was Paul's last episode. Shortly after this, he was beheaded. So in chapter 2, verse 1, he tells Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Remember, remember that in other epistles, he tells us to be strong in other things. For instance, in Ephesians 6, he says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. 
So God is a source of power. You be strong. You receive that strength into your own life. You have that power infused in you. You be strong. But now he's talking about something else. He says, be strong in grace. Be strong in the grace. So God is the source of grace. God has bestowed his grace on you and me. In fact, the Bible talks about it as, as God has lavished us with grace. Ephesians 2, he talks about God's abundant grace. He talks about the exceeding riches of his grace, the wealth of his grace, the abundant wealth of his grace. God has lavished that grace, but he's saying you got to be strong in the grace that is given to us in Christ. Be established in that grace. What does that mean? It means you don't let anybody shake you. Or let anything shake you from the fact that God is a God of grace. And his grace has been extended to you. His abundant riches of grace has been extended to you. The devil is very good at trying to get us off grace. Into maybe works. I have to earn things from God. You know, only if I do this, only if I read 10 chapters a day, God will smile at me. <laughs> or only if I, you know, give so much money, God will be happy. Only if I do all A, B, C, D, E, F, G, God will have, you know, do all of this. And so we can get out of grace into works. Paul says, no. Be strong in the grace. Be established in that grace. Yes, we do works not to earn anything. We do works because we've experienced the abundant riches of His grace. We experienced it. So out of a joyful heart, a life that has just been blessed by His grace of God, I'm just happy to just lay it all down. Whatever I can give you, I'll just give it all. Because He has lavished His grace upon us. Another area the devil may want to move us out of grace is into guilt and condemnation. So grace embraces us, has lavished favor, divine favor where God sees. God says, I see you as my beloved. Well, the devil is the accuser of the brethren. He's the one who brings shame and condemnation and guilt. And he draws, takes us out of that place of grace. So be strong in, in the grace of God. You know, Paul told Galatians, stand, therefore in, stand firm, therefore, in the liberty where Christ has set us free. And be not entangled once again with a yoke of bondage. Talking about the law. In Romans 5, he says, you know, now that we are justified by grace. You know, you stand in, in this grace that we stand before God. You be firm in that. So be strong in the grace. Grace is also empowering. So the word grace in the New Testament is used in many different ways. One of them is also grace empowers. Grace is favor, but grace is also empowering. So the grace of God on your life empowers you. But the devil wants to make us feel inadequate to the point we don't do anything. See, we all have these feelings of inadequacy. You know, when we are faced with a task, or say, God, you know, this is so big, so great. I mean, uh, we feel, and that's okay. But that's when we rely on the grace. Yes, I know in my own self, I am not up to this challenge, up to this task. But that's why there is grace. The grace of God empowers me. And I know because of His grace, I can go forward. I can still work on it. And His grace will undergird us, undertake for all of my limit, all of our limitations, all of our inadequacies. And so because we are firm in the grace of God, we don't shy away from the challenge or, or the, the, the greatness of the task. But we go ahead knowing that His grace will undertake. But what the enemy does is, 
He makes us feel so inadequate that we shy away from the call, from the task, from the assignment that God has. Now that is stepping out of grace. You've got to stand firm in the grace of God. I know God by his grace can help me do this. In my own self, yes, I may have lots of limitations. But the grace of God empowers me. So Paul is saying, Timothy, you're a man of God. You're a servant of God. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Verse 2. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. What you have heard from me, Timothy, I want you to pass it on to somebody else or some others so that they in turn can pass it on to more people. A multiplication that is taking place. So the challenge for you and me is this. What are you and I doing with what God has put in our lives? What are you doing with what God has put in you? Some of us may say, oh, well, I, I still need to read the whole Bible. I still need to, you know, understand the Hebrew and the Greek. And I still need to, you know, finish my theology degree. And this. listen, you know, that may take eternity, you know. Don't worry about those things. What do you have now? What is your journey with God? What have you experienced with God? What are you doing with it? Are you passing it on to somebody else? And in my own experience... Now, I'm not saying this to boast, but just to say this, that, look, you can do it. My own experience, I was just 13 years of age, and I'd just been saved. And I didn't have any great experience. Gabriel didn't come. Michael was busy somewhere else. So it wasn't like I had some angel come, nothing. It was a very simple prayer I prayed in the corner of the chapel there in Bishop Cotton Boys School. And I just prayed a simple prayer. Which my teacher led me in. I just followed. I just said the prayer. But that something changed in me. I started reading my Bible. I started going back for prayer. The next thing I did was I went to the school chaplain. I said, chaplain, I want to talk to all the students. I hadn't even read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But what I did read, I knew the four spiritual laws. You're a sinner, you're going to hell. Jesus Christ died for you. Believe in Jesus, you'll be saved. I don't know what the fourth law was. <laughs> but, you know, I knew those four things that I needed to preach. And I told the chaplain, I want to preach. He didn't know what to say. He said, okay. So I said, please give me two days, half message. You know, I started series back then. <laughs> Half message day one, second half the day two. So first day in the chapel, you know, the chapel, you have the principal, you have all this, most of the stuff, most of the students came to the chapel those days at Bishop Cotton's. It was packed. So first day, I told them, you're all sinners, you're all going to go to hell. <laughs> but come back tomorrow, I'll tell you how to go to heaven. <laughs> so next day, the chapel was packed. All the students were there. I just told them, you know, Jesus died for us sins. You got to get saved. You got to believe in Jesus. Only then you go to heaven. So just with that little knowledge that I had, started preaching. And, you know, things started happening there in school and went on to the other schools. I'd, next daring step I did was I went to the pastor of the Methodist church. You know, and the pastor said, Pastor, I want to, can you give me 15 minutes, Sunday morning, Sunday evening? Oh, I don't know, maybe he got scared. He said, I'll pray about it and I'll get back to you. So about two weeks later, he came back. Thank God for this pastor. You know, I, I really appreciate him. But he said, okay, I'm going to give you 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the evening. This is Methodist Church, Richmond Town. So here I was, just, I think I was just 14 years of age, standing there. I, walked, I was all ready, waiting for that Sunday morning. And uh, he said, okay, we have a young boy. He wants to say something. So I went up to the pulpit, and I had read at least Matthew. So I knew Matthew chapter 7. <laughs> and I still remember, I preached that Sunday morning from Matthew 7. By their fruit, you will know them. There was pin drop silence. 
Now even I was scared by the silence. <laughs> and then I walked out and then I was hearing all the elders speaking and I heard one man tell the other man, he said, that boy preached like we're all sinners. <laughs> that was the only comment I heard. <laughs> So I was a little discouraged, but somehow I said, okay, go back Sunday evening. So Sunday evening, went back to the church, and Sunday evening, they're all students. You know, the Baldwin boys, boys and girls school, they would attend the Sunday evening service. I think they still do. A lot of students there. So preach again, 15 minutes. And then I said, all of you want to give your life to Christ? Stay back after the service. Now, I was not expecting anybody to stay back. But about 30 students decided they're going to stay back. I don't know what to say to them now. <laughs> I was not prepared for all this. Nobody, I never knew about discipleship and follow up. And I never knew all that. You know, whoops, excuse me. But they all stayed back. So I had to, you know, make up something right then and there. And I said, okay, guys, uh, you know, tomorrow lunch break, I'll come to your school. You know, Cotton's wasn't too far, is not too far away from Baldwin's. Uh, and they all said, okay, um, we'll meet at this, you know, the dining area there. So told me where to come. So Monday, I'm waiting for the lunch bell to ring. As soon as the lunch bell rang, I grabbed my Bible and I ran down Hayes Road, up Richmond Road, back gate of Baldwin's. No authorization, no permission. I didn't care. I'm like the Apostle Paul. <laughs> I'm on a mission. I went in there and sure enough, all these kids were there. And I preached the same gospel, you know. I would just preach the same message, just approach it from different angles <laughs> every day. And that was it. People got saved. Until today, uh, there are people who come back and say, hey, I was in that group. I was standing there listening to you, and I gave my life to Christ. Lives have been changed. And I was just, I was just a 13, 14-year-old. The point I want to make is this. You know, I didn't know much. I hadn't even read the New Testament. But the little I knew, I wanted to pass it on. And I took some radical steps. I'm not saying you should do the same thing. But I just took some steps to do what I can to pass it on. And so Paul is telling Timothy, whatever you've learned, you pass it on to others so that they in turn can pass it on to more people. More people. So I believe that each of us who have been part of church for some time, we have learned so many things. We have received much. But you need to pray. We all need to pray and say, God, how can I pass this on? And it may, it may be a small way. It may be something big. Uh, doesn't matter. But pass on whatever God has put into your heart, into your life, so that some others can be blessed. And they in turn will bless more people. Verse 3 onwards. We'll read verses 3 to 6, 7. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hard-working farmer must be first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say. And may the Lord give you understanding in all things. So remember now, Paul is trying to you know, guide Timothy as a, as a minister of God, as a servant of God. And he draws three analogies. First, that of the soldier. Second, that of the athlete. And third, that of the farmer. And using these analogies, he's trying to highlight certain characteristics that Timothy needs to maintain in his life to be a good minister of the Lord. So he says, first, Timothy, you must endure hardship like a good soldier. Be willing to put on with some difficulties, some hardships. And so it is true for you and me. That if you, you and I want to serve God, don't look for a life of ease and comfort. Be ready for some hardships. Some challenges, some, you know, you need to make a little sacrifice to serve the Lord. So he says, as a good soldier, be ready to endure hardship. Pastor, I'm ready for mission trip, but please make sure there's an air-conditioned room. 
Listen, some places, yes, there will be a conditioned room. Some places, no. I remember, I think it was, I forget which year it was, but one of those years, we were just outside of, again, I forget the name of the city. Maybe it was outside of, I think it was Bhopal, somewhere, some, some village area. It was, it was so hot, 40 something. And you had a hall of, you know, maybe over 100 young people sitting in that intense heat the entire day, not 45 minutes, the entire day wanting to learn the word of God. Heat, intense. And look out the window, the ground was dry. I don't know, it's like by the time you finish the first hour, you're soaking already and you've got another six hours to go. But they're sitting, they're ready to listen. I'm thinking of God, you know, East has nice air conditioned hall, <laughs> tries to preach and teach there. But, you know, being in this place where it's so hot, yet it's okay. And for us, it's only three days. You go there, minister, and come back. But think about those people in that heat. They serve God. They go out into the villages preaching the gospel and so on. And so for you and I, uh, people living in cities, uh, we need to be willing to step out and do things that will be uncomfortable. Uh, and don't always look for comfort. He says, you endure hardship as a good soldier. Next, he says... That just like a soldier, his life is different from that of a civil civilian. A soldier is always ready for the call of duty. He may be taking care of his family or doing his responsibilities, but he's not so caught up in that that he cannot respond to the call of duty. So he says, no man who's, who fights gets so entangled with the affairs of this life. So it's just, you live that way. That you're ready to respond to what God calls you to do. I'm not saying that we are abscond from our responsibilities to our, towards our family and our children or towards our parents or whatever. We fulfill those responsibilities but we live in such a way that we are ready to answer the call, the instruction that God gives us. Whatever he wants us to do, we will do it. As a soldier. And then he says, an athlete... You know, an athlete may be highly trained, great athlete, but he's not going to win unless he competes according to the... He's got to run the race, but he's got to run it according to the rules. He's got to start only when the gun fires, stay in his lane, make sure you finish right. Only then he's going to win. And so also, when you and I want to serve God, we've got to serve God according to his terms. Meet his requirements according to his standards. You and I don't say, God, I'll serve you, but it's on my terms, God. No. You serve God on his terms. Do what he says. Follow his standards, what he, he requires of you and me. And lastly, about the farmer. He says, look at the farmer. The farmer is hardworking. But it's a hardworking farmer who enjoys the fruit. So four things. As a soldier, in your hardship, as a soldier, compete or you work according to God's requirements. Thirdly, as, a, sorry, as an athlete, you, as a soldier, in your hardship, as a soldier, you, uh, you respond to the call of duty. You're not so entangled with things. As a farmer, you work hard. As an athlete, you compete according to the rules. You follow God's guidelines as you serve Him. You all with me so far? Okay, let's move forward. Verses 8 through 10. Remember that Jesus Christ, the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel, for which I suffered trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains, but the word of God is not chained. Therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. He says, Timothy, you know, the gospel we are preaching, we are preaching about a resurrected Savior. And because of preaching that gospel, look at me. I am also in chains. I mean, I'm not just telling you that you should endure hardship and that you should work hard and that you should be like a soldier. Look at me, Timothy. Look at my life. I am suffering like an evildoer as I'm a criminal for preaching that eternal gospel. I'm in chains. But I'm doing it because I want others to experience salvation in Jesus Christ. So he's saying, Timothy... 
I'm not just telling you to do these things. Look at my life. I'm in prison. But I'm doing this for the sake of the gospel and for the salvation of souls. Verses 11 to 13, he says, This is a faithful saying. For if we died with him, we will live with him. If we endure, we will reign. If we deny, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny us. Timothy, this is our hope. That even if we die, we know we are going to live with him. If we endure hardship, we are going to reign. There's an eternity or there's at least a millennium that you're going to reign with Jesus. You're going to reign with him. So he says, look, even if we suffer now, we have a hope. We're going to live with him. We're going to reign with him. But Timothy, if we deny him, he has no choice but to deny us. Jesus said, if you confess me before men on earth, I will confess you before my father. But if you deny me, I can't say anything different. So says Timothy, we have no choice. We have a hope. But we cannot deny the Lord. And yet he says, but if we, even if we are faithless, we come to a point where our faith is low or even gone, our faithless, God still remains faithful. And I think for almost all of us in life, we will encounter those situations when our faith is really low. And maybe there are times when you're like, man, faith, oh, I'm close to being faithless. <laughs> but I want us to understand that even in those moments, God still remains faithful. He's faithful to you and me. Right? We, we, you know, we, we may have those, those, those times in life when our faith goes up and down. And maybe you reach those moments when you seem like you're faithless. But the Bible says, yeah, if, even if we are faithless, He remains faithful. He says, I'm staying with you. So there's a difference here from denying the Lord and just being faithless. Denying is outright saying no, but faithless is okay. I'm in that moment, my faith is low and I'm, I'm down. And God still remains faithful. And he cannot deny himself. The beautiful thing is even when we go through those times in life and you know, our faith is really low, there is God. We just go back to him. He restores us. He renews us. He rebuilds us. And he revives us. And he takes us on to higher levels. Because he stays faithful to us. Even through the ups and downs of life. He stays faithful. Amen. Let's move on. So verse 14. <clears throat> Remind them of these things. Charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit to the ruin of the hearer. So it says, tell the church, tell people all of these things that I've told you. So Timothy, this, this is a message not just for you. It's also for the people in the church. Tell them the same things. And also make sure you tell them not to waste their time arguing about words that don't profit anything. Now sometimes we... Spend a lot of time arguing about things. You know, must pass to wear white shirt all the time. Must he wear this robe with a collar around his neck? Or you know, I mean, we argue, we argue, we discuss all the silly things. And it says, don't waste your time on such things. They don't profit anything. They just ruin the hearers. But instead, verse fifteen, what must you do, Timothy? He says, be diligent. That means you. Be focused, and this is an ongoing thing. Diligence is not a one-time thing. Diligence is an ongoing thing. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a work, work, worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the truth, the word of truth. Three things, Timothy. This is what you've got to be carefully looking at. What? First, to make sure that you are always walking approved before God. Do things that are right before God. Live that way. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God. Live that way. Is what I'm doing right in God's eyes? Does God approve of it? Say, God, yesterday I lived a life 
right before your eyes today. Please excuse me. No. Every day you live right. Present yourself approved to God. Second, be a worker who does not need to be ashamed. So just imagine, you know, your boss at work says, all right, can you get this proposal done for me by 5 o'clock Friday evening? So yes, boss, I'll surely get it done. Absolutely, I'll get it done. And then you take a little break. Friday, you go on a holiday, you know, <laughs> whatever. And then you realize, man, I haven't done it. Monday morning, you're going to try to sneak into your office. You don't want to meet your boss because you haven't done it. Little ashamed. Paul says, don't be like that. Be a worker who does not need to be ashamed. So be somebody that you know, as far as you, to the best of your ability, to the best of what God's called you to do, you're doing the things God wants you to do. You're on time, you're there, you're fulfilling God's call, your responsibility. So be a worker who does not need to be ashamed before God. And then he says, you rightly divide the word of truth. Many correct, cut the word straight. So don't cut it like this and, you know, make your own Changes to the word. No, cut it straight. Rightly divide the word of truth. You've got to be careful to do that. And that's something we want to make sure we do here as a church. That we rightly divide the word of truth. And, and, and stay with everything that we find in the Gospels, the New Testament. And everything that the Lord has given to us. We want to rightly divide the word of truth. Verses 16 through 18. But shun profane and idle babblings. For they will increase to more ungodliness. And their message will spread like cancer. Hymenus and Philetus are of this sort, who are straight concerning the truth, saying the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. So he says, you know, once again, he's telling Timothy, Timothy, just stay away from all the silly talk, the idle talk that goes on. It's only going to result in people becoming more ungodly. So don't get involved in silly talk. And then he mentions to men, we don't know too much about these people other than they have strayed away from the faith and they are now disturbing and overthrowing the faith of others by their wrong message that the resurrection has already taken place. So, you know, he's saying, look, just stay away from all this. Stay away from things that, that are idle. And then I think verses 19 to 21 are, are some of the most important verses here for um, a servant of God. He says in verse 19, Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are His, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. So he's drawing an, another analogy, another comparison. He's saying, you know, in people's homes, they have, set, they have you know, a set of utensils which are used day to day, every day. But then they have the other set of utensils they use when the pastor comes. <laughs> well, usually the pastor doesn't come, but... You know, somebody else, some, somebody comes. When they have special guests, the vessels of honor, right? So when they have somebody important, you know, maybe their boss or some, they all have a special meal. They take out those special dishes and they, and they use those special utensils to serve. And he uses an analogy. He says, Timothy, if you want to be a vessel of honor, a vessel like this, that God takes and he uses for special purposes that he himself is, you know, quote unquote, proud to use. That he wants to put on display and that he wants to release special purposes through. If you want to do that, then here are four things. And he says that this is available to anybody. If anyone, anyone, that means all of us. If anyone cleanses himself, so first thing is clean up the vessel. Cleanses himself from sin, from whatever is dishonorable. Then he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified. Sanctified means set apart for holy use. Sanctified. And he will be useful. Useful meaning you're available, easy to use is what the little Greek means. Available, an English word that, that's comparable. He'll be available for the master. 
And fourth, he'll be prepared, ready, equipped for every good work. So if I want to be a vessel of honor, if you want to be a vessel of honor, this opportunity is available for all of us. It's not for some select people. All of us can become vessels of honor. If we meet these requirements, what is he saying? Cleanse yourself. Second, set yourself apart for God. Third, be available. Fourth, be equipped. And he'll use you. For the master. The master will use you. As we're going through my college days, this, this particular verse, these two verses, 19, 20, 21, was so important to me. I just keep coming back to these verses. To keep telling myself, that's my choice. I'm choosing to become a vessel for honor. Because there's all kinds of pressures. But you say, no, I choose not to involve myself in that. I choose not to do that. I choose not to do that. I choose not to do it. I choose to keep myself clean. I choose to be sanctified or set apart. Because I want to be a vessel for honor. It's a choice we all make. And it's an ongoing thing. It's not like I did it then. It continues to live that way now. Choose to keep your vessel clean. Set, it, set yourself apart for God. Be available. Lord, whatever you say, I'm ready to do. Be available. And continue to be equipped. Continue to be prepared. Continue to keep learning. You never stop learning. So that the master can use you. Amen? And this is available for all of us. And then he finally closes with, this, with these verses here. Verses, sorry, I'll read verse 22 and then verse 22. In view of this, Timothy, he says, flee also youthful lusts. So get run away from all the youthful lusts. Things that young people get entrapped in. Says Timothy, run away from all of that. But instead, you run after what is righteousness, faith, love, peace. With all those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So here this whole sense, the whole idea of togetherness, of community. That you do this along with others who are also doing the same thing. And that's why, you know, things like life group, being part of a church community, being around believers or pursuing the same thing is so important. That as you want to be a vessel of honor, you want to run away from youthful lust and you want to pursue these things. Be around those who are also doing the same thing. It's going to help you and I. It's going to help us. Verses 23 to 26. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient. In humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance, so that they may know the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. So Timothy, you know, there will be people who oppose you. There will be people who oppose the gospel, who oppose Jesus Christ. But how should a servant of God handle this? He said, first of all, don't get into disputes and debates and arguments. Don't get into those things. The servant of the Lord must not get into strife. So they shout, you shout, they shout louder, you shout louder. They shout a little louder, you shout. No, no, no. The servant of the Lord must not get into this. But what do you do with people who oppose you? Be gentle. The servant of the Lord must not strive. But be gentle to all. Deal with gentleness. Be patient. Be able to teach them with gentleness, with love. Because you understand two things. One, you understand their predicament. They are in a situation where they are taken captive by the devil. They are actually in a snare of the devil. They are in that situation. And secondly, understand that it is God who is going to move on them. To bring them to a place of repentance and embracing the truth. Not me. Not our arguments. It's God who's going to move on them. 
So what do you do? Be gentle. Don't get in arguments. Don't get into strife. Don't get in fighting with them. In gentleness, you deal with them. You teach them. You show them. In gentleness. And let God bring them to that place of repentance and embracing the truth so that they can come to their senses and come out of the snare of the devil that they are that they're actually in right now. That's how the servant of the Lord must handle those who oppose the gospel. Are you with me? Those are awake, say yes. The others, <laughs> amen. So this chapter, 2 Timothy chapter 2, is full of important instructions to anyone who really wants to serve God. Who wants to be a servant of the Lord. Because he concludes this chapter by saying the servant of the Lord must be like this. So really all these instructions are applicable. And I'm sure all of us here, sooner or later, are going to serve God. Some way. Got to serve God in small ways, big ways. What a way God's called you. And all these instructions are important for you and me. This is how I must live. As somebody who wants to serve God. Do the things he's called us to do. I just want to highlight one verse. I think there are many things here. But I'll just highlight one verse here. Which Paul, what Paul writes to Timothy, verse 21. If anyone cleanses himself from the latter, that meaning whatever is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honor. He will be a vessel for honor. He'll be sanctified. He'll be set apart holy unto God. He'll be available, useful to the master. And he'll be prepared, equipped for the master's use. Amen? Let's rise to our feet, please. I'll just call the worship team up. This morning, I just want to lay an invitation before you and me that all of us have the opportunity to be vessels of honor. So, all of us have the opportunity to be vessels of honor, all of us. That we can be vessels that God can use. We all start at the same point. Where we all begin in that place where our vessels are marred. Our vessels are dirty. Our vessels have been contaminated, whatever, with all the things we've done. We all start there. But the beautiful thing is. God works in our lives, cleans us out, sanctifies us. He makes us the kind of vessel he wants us to be. And he all he asks of us is, are you willing to be available? Are you willing to be available? And he will equip you with me so that he can use us in whatever way he chooses. So this morning, before we leave this place, would you take a few moments just to respond and say, God, this vessel you can use. Regardless of where you and I are today, if people say, God, here's, here I am. You take me, God. You make me a vessel of honor. A vessel that you will use for purposes that you choose on this earth. I want to be a vessel of honor. I make myself available. Would you pray that, pray that prayer this morning? Don't look at yourself, but stand firm in the grace that is in Jesus Christ. It's His grace that will empower you and me to be those vessels that he can use. We'll take a few moments to pray. And then I also do want to pray for all the mothers. And just thank God for the mothers and their lives and what they do for us. For every family, for every home.
Father God, I just pray over everyone here this morning that you will work in our hearts and in our lives, Father, in such a way that we will all become vessels of honor, vessels that are useful to the Master, vessels that are ready for every good work you've called each one of us to do, wherever it may be, in whatever sphere of influence, and wherever you positioned us in the world, that we will be ready for the works that you want to release through us. Father, I pray for that grace upon each one, Father, that we will live lives full of purpose, live lives that are releasing the works of God on the earth, the purposes of God on the earth, each one, Father. That we will, God, shy away from everything that distracts us or tries to take us away from the purposes of God. And that we will press through and be those vessels of honor. I pray this upon each one of us. Upon each of us, Father. I pray that you will release that sense of purpose and destiny in each of our hearts. That we are here for your purpose. And we want to be vessels that you can use. We thank you. And we bless you, Father. 
this morning before we close, we just like to take a few moments to give an invitation to anyone who's never experienced Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Like I shared with you earlier, as a 13-year-old, I just prayed a simple prayer. I said, Jesus, take my life. It wasn't very sophisticated. It was just a few sentences. But something changed. Something changed. Changed the rest of my life. I began to experience God in a very personal, a very precious way. Does anyone here this morning that you have never had that experience where you've been born again, where you've received Jesus into your life and you know your sins are forgiven and you're in a personal relationship with God? If you never had that experience, and I want to just lead you in a simple prayer. There's nothing magical about the prayer. It's just a small thing that you talk to God about, but it's what God does in you at that moment that makes all the difference. So if you've never experienced this transformation in your life and would like to do that, I just invite you to pray this prayer with me right now. Just say this simple prayer with me. Lord Jesus, forgive my sins. Make me a new person, God. I believe you died for me on the cross. And you rose up again. And you're alive today. I invite you to be my Savior. To be my Lord. Help me to follow you. And you alone the rest of my life and I ask this in Jesus name Amen if there's anyone you prayed this prayer with me for the very first time and if you don't mind could just raise your hand so we could see you acknowledge what God has done in your life anybody you prayed this prayer with me for the very first time you can raise your hands let's see and Anyone, you pray this prayer with me for the very first time? Just raise your hand. Okay, we see at least one hand up there. God bless you. Anybody else? Okay. Our greeters will come. They'll give you a red bag. We call it the New Believers Bag. Along with that, you'll receive a card called a decision card. If you could please write your name, your contact details, and just hand it back to them. Uh, we will get in touch with you. The resources in the bag are free. Uh, to help you build your faith and uh, we will give you instructions on how to use that in case you felt shy and didn't raise your hand our greeters will be at the exit so just tell them hey i prayed that prayer can i have the bag and they'll be more than happy to give it to you let's close father i just declare lord your abundant grace on each of your people the grace of our lord jesus christ the love of God our Father and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit continue with each of us in an ever-increasing measure. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Pastor Jakes, could you please pray for all the mothers? Okay, uh, before we pray, why don't we just give them a big hand? All the mothers in the house. Thank you for stepping up. Thank you for all the responsibilities that you shoulder. Um, let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you for, for all the mothers who are here right now. Father, we thank you for, for making them special, oh God. We thank you for the call upon their lives, oh God. Father, we thank you for all the gifts and abilities that you put in a person as a mother. And, and Father, we thank you that each one of us have been nurtured by our mothers. Father, we thank you for making them who they are. And Lord, we, we commit them into your mighty hands one more time today. And Lord, we pray that, um, that you would refresh their hearts this morning. That you would heal their hearts this morning. That you would strengthen them. I pray that you would release a freshness, O oh God, over them right now, God. And I pray that you would 
pour out your love and your joy may they experience that in a fresh way this morning father we we give thanks to you for their lives we pray that they'll continue to run the race with joy with endurance and touch many more lives and nurture many more lives for your kingdom in jesus name amen amen god bless we trust that this message was a blessing to you we'd love to hear from you you can email us at contact@apcwo.org also visit our website apcwo.org for additional resources thank you for listening and god bless you